Hello, I'm Christine Mummery, and I'd like to welcome you to our second annual Women in Science discussion panel. I'll be moderating the panel today. So why do I personally have an interest in this area? I'm Professor of Developmental Biology at Leiden University Medical Center, and many young people may think, okay, you kind of made it. But I didn't feel like that in the beginning of my career. I, I studied in the UK, I studied physics, and when I um, started studying, uh, there were about 50% women and 50% men, so it didn't seem to me to be an issue. But for my postdoc, I came for the net to the Netherlands, and it was quite a culture shock. So whilst my mother and my two grandmothers had worked their whole lives, I came to the Netherlands to a country which had banned uh, married women from working by law as, uh, since until 1964. So I came among a generation of women who all had non-working mothers. And I thought that was kind of strange, but I didn't particularly notice at the postdoc stage. But as time went on, I began to find more and more and more that I was on my own in panels and in meetings. There were hardly any women left. And as time's gone by, the culture's changed here, but I realized there was going to be an awful lot of mentoring necessary to, to bridge this gender uh, gap over the generations. Um, and it turned out that it wasn't just a problem of the Netherlands. There were many countries for different reasons have a situation where women don't pro progress into to, uh, higher functions in the STEM, in the science, technology, engineering and medicine. So what are we going to do uh, today? We have... Um, We're going to uh, look at the themes from uh, the previous uh, panel. The community, when we looked at this last year, the community valued coming together to talk about the unique challenges women face in STEM careers. The majority of, of people in attendance were women, but they felt they'd been treated differently from their male colleagues and experienced some sort of harassment. So sometimes it was me too type of harassment and there was a surprising number of, of women said this had uh, happened to them. And I remember Doug Melton being really surprised to see that even people, uh, that uh, young women that he knew had some kind of experience in this way. But the harassment wasn't only of that nature, it was also to do with hierarchy. We also heard from that meeting, people would like not only to hear about uh, differences because of gender, but also experiences because of diverse backgrounds. And that's um, minority groups, but also a gay community, you could say, um, transgenders, various um, other groups. We should pay more attention actively within the ISSER to make sure we are inclusive. And it's all the more important in these days uh, where we're thinking about Black Lives Matter. So today's goal is to come together as a community and work towards solutions, to ask what we can do to promote women in science. So um, how can the uh, ISSER community help you, help us, and how can we move forward together? We have today uh, four panelists, my, including myself, um, all are top scientists or top um, uh, engineers in their field. We will hear from uh, esteemed, these esteemed people who bring diverse perspectives and experiences to date, today's conversation and who will help us work towards solutions. After their presentations, we will look forward to having a discussion with all of you to come up with some concrete ideas, real solutions and strategies for overcoming diversity. But what is preventing women from getting to the top? To set the stage for today's conversation, I want to look at where women are getting stuck in the academic or industry pipeline. Understanding these patterns could help us identify sticking points and what is needed to help women and underrepresented minorities progress. At what point in our career growth are we hitting a barrier towards progression? We will look at a few data points from studies that were done in STEM departments around the world. So these are the questions we're going to address. And this was a very interesting uh, survey carried out four years ago by the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute. 
Uh, Susan Solomon, its CEO, uh, was awarded the Public Service Award by ISSER, and she was instrumental in putting this service to get this uh, survey together. So what she did was brought together a diverse group of scientists, physicians, and leaders to create a working group for the Initiative on Women in Science and Engineering. She called it IWISE. They set out to create ins institutional report cards for gender equality, to evaluate commitments in promoting gender parity by examining gender representation throughout the educational and academic pipeline. They collected data from 541 unique institutions across 38 countries. It was really quite a, 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 a large effort. And it was published in, in Cell Stem Cell, but we've just picked out this figure here in which the x-axis represents the proportion of women between zero and 100% among the given population. So red represents students, yellow shows recruited faculty, and in blue are people in professorships or equivalent leadership positions. The y-axis represents the number of institutions falling into each bin. The data clearly show that women were found to be well represented among undergraduates, graduates, and postgraduate students. But among faculty, however, as seniority increased, the representation of women decreased. Now, perhaps this is not a surprise. This was taken over many countries. And if I look at my own institution, it, it does maintain some uh, statistics. And this is looking at math, uh, women in math and science, which clearly shows it decreases with seniority. So these are the men. This was in 2009. This was in 2013. And here are the women. So there is a slight difference uh, here, but it only becomes um, uh, worse that it's differential as time goes on. Now, there was a very interesting uh, paper in science just a couple of, uh, of weeks ago, um, which I thought gave a lot of insight. It actually showed that these women who actually make it are the high achievers. And the men, some of the men who make it are also the high achievers. And there, there's actually very little gender disbalance. They're about equal. Where the difference comes is in the middle or low achievers. Now, that's an interesting thought. That means maybe men are recognizing the Peter principle slightly less well in themselves than women. And it turns out this particular survey showed that women had recognized their other skills, for example, in language or writing. And as soon they, as they realize, as everybody does, at about this postdoc stage, one realizes to make a career in science is going to be really hard. And at that point, most people are between 35 and 40, and the women reflect, what else could I do? Because I'm not sure I'm into that rat race. And perhaps the men think, okay, I'll go for it and we'll see. So it may not be just about uh, recognizing talent. It may also be in looking at the mid-level career people and encouraging women to stay in there because you never know later on where you will you will be a high achiever. And secondly, um, it's uh, we also need in science not only great thinkers. We also need people to do the research, to do the training, to do the teaching and many other aspects of science. You always need a team, a second team to back up the high flyers. So we need everybody on board uh, to keep this uh, going. That's maybe some provocative thoughts there, perhaps something for the discussion. But the article in Science is well worth reading. So what about looking at women of colour? Again, highly underrepresented in the engineering faculty. What you see here are the, are the numbers. We can see that among assistant associates uh, and, and, and professors, um, white uh, Caucasians are, are um, the representation is about constant, uh, at least in the assistant associate professor level. But as soon as it comes uh, to, for, ex for example, uh, black, we see no representation at all or very little uh, among the professor levels. So we need to do something uh, about this. So, of course, women are not a homogenous population, so we may have some points of discussion there. What we'd like to do is uh, to do a poll, though. And this is um, the first time this poll has actually been used at the meeting so far, and we're not quite sure whether it'll work, but um, we thought we'd give it a go. So uh, the question here, is, is your institution or company taking active steps to create awareness around or promote women in 
in science, te technology, engineering, and math. And if you could um, fill that in, we'd be very grateful. So it looks as though most institutions are taking active steps and you are aware of them, but it seems that 25% of the people here online, no, it's changing. So now we're getting a little bit uh, more even. So this, I would say, has changed from being quite encouraging to now quite worrying. It seems that uh, about a third of institutions are taking no active uh, responsibility for this. About 30% people are not, not aware or they don't know. And less, slightly less than half are only aware of positive actions. So it looks that at least at institution levels, either the institutions should be doing something or should they should make whatever they are doing more widely known. So let's uh, now move uh, to today, today's programme. This is the outcome. I think that's very helpful to know where we are uh, with this. We will now hear from our panellists who will share their experience on gender-related adversity and how they work to overcome challenges in their own careers. We will also briefly touch on how the current COVID crisis intersects with gender roles and expectations the potential and the potential long lasting effects of this. And we've seen that this can be a very serious issue, not only now, but certainly in the in the future. We will then have a panel discussion where panelists can answer your questions and we can try and come up with uh, solutions together as a community. We already have one actionable uh, measure, I think, from the poll that about uh, only about half of our institutes have uh, awareness or, or let me aware that um, we have an issue. So the, the panelists uh, are here. Uh, we have three. Um, there are three esteemed uh, scientists. Uh, Sangeeta Bhatia will kick us off. She's director of the laboratory for multi-scale regenerative technologies at MIT. Sangeeta is a biomedical researcher and biotech entrepreneur who works to adapt technologies developed in the computer industry for medical in innovation. She is a passionate inventor and advocate for diversity in science and engineering, winning the Heinz Medal for groundbreaking inventions and advocacy for women in STEM fields. Our second panelist is Masayo Takahashi. She's president of Vision Care Incorporated in Japan. Masayo has been a pioneer in using induced pluripotent stem cells to, um, to treat um, age-related macular degeneration. She was awarded the Agawa Yamanaka Prize in Stem Cell Biology in 2015 and was named as one of five scientists to watch in 2014 by Nature magazine. She is now president of a startup company with the ultimate goal of bringing stem cell therapies to patients. And our final panelist is uh, Rana Dajani, who is associate professor of molecular cell biology in Hashemite University in Jordan and is currently a visiting professor at the University of Richmond in the United States. Rana helped establish stem cell research ethics uh, law in Jordan, organized the first gender subnet for the Arab world in 2017 and has received many honors for including, uh, including one, being one for the most influential women scientists in the Islamic world. Her book, Five Scarves Doing the Impossible shares her experience as a female Arab Muslim scientist. I look forward to hearing more about our panelists and learning about the strategies they have used to overcome gender related adversity and then brainstorming around these important issues with all of you. We will take questions and answers during the panel discussion. Please enter any questions in the Q&A panel and indicate who the questions are for. This is to help us organize the questions and answers properly. So we will now hear firstly from Sangeeta Bhatia from MIT. Sangeeta. Hi, Christine. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you this morning, however virtually. Um, I thought I would start by uh, sharing a little bit of my personal journey and then share with you a, a recent project that I've been working on related to women in startups. 
Uh, so just to sort of give you a little bit of background, I uh, am the daughter of Indian immigrants. Uh, my parents were actually refugees at the partition of colonial India in 1947. And uh, they found their way to Mumbai and made their way to the US in the mid 1960s uh, when I was born. And I was uh, raised, uh, educated in the public schools, uh, one of two girls, and my dad encouraged me to be an engineer, uh, which uh, as you know, is a field where there are very few women historically, and uh, still that's the case. Um, when I went on to university, I went to um, Brown University. I had very much the same experience that uh, Christine described in her journey, which was initially freshman year, I looked around the classroom in engineering and noted that it was 50% women. And I thought that the stories I'd heard about the lack of representation in engineering um, were stories of the past. Um, and by the time I was a senior, so just four years later, uh, the graduating class had 7% women. Um, and so that was a, a very real example of the sort of so-called leaky pipeline, which are those, those data that uh, Christine showed you. Um, I then took a gap year and went on to uh, graduate school to the MD PhD program at MIT and Harvard. Um, and I trained there in the 90s um, and met uh, a hero of mine um, who would subsequently become a friend named Nancy Hopkins. And at that time, she was actually doing um, work what, which would subsequently be called the Gender Equity Report, um, where they had noticed her and her colleagues, the so-called MIT 16, that uh, women were um, not being treated fairly uh, within the walls of academia. So there were very few women on the faculty. They seemed to have less space, lower salaries. Uh, there were not provisions for daycare, et cetera. Um, and so what Nancy and her colleagues did, which became a model really for, for my career in advocacy was collect the data. Um, and she and her colleagues literally went around and measured lab space with a tape measure uh, and then make a case to the institution and find uh, a champion, which they did in Chuck Vest, who was the president of MIT at the time. Um, and they very famously published this gender equity report in the 90s, um, which led to, at least in the US, a rolling out of policy changes around uh, the number of women faculty and how they are treated. Uh, and so that really left an impression on me as a graduate student in the 90s, watching that unfold. Uh, I then joined the faculty at UC San Diego for my first faculty position, uh, was promoted, which was terrific, and um, had my first daughter and really wanted to come home. Uh, so uh, my husband came along uh, with me to San Diego, which was terrific and he was very supportive. And I moved back to Boston to be uh, near my family so our kids could grow up knowing their parents, which is kind of what I had always imagined. So we now have two girls um, and at MIT, I. Um, set out to continue my research at the interface of miniaturization and medicine with programs in liver disease and in cancer. And I sort of had to break it to my dad. You'll recall that he wanted me to be an engineer and now I had become a professor <laughs> that, um, that I was gonna stay in what he thought of as the ivory tower. Um, and he said, well, okay, it's okay if you're a professor, but when will you start your first company? Um, my dad was a serial entrepreneur. So those words were really important to me, not when will you start a company, when will you start your first company? Um, and for him, you know, it was really important to use that vehicle to take inventions to the highest uh, sort of dimension of their impact. Um, and that planted a seed in my mind. And so I started thinking about entrepreneurship and taking my inventions out into the, um, into the world. Uh, and I did start my first company uh, around 2007 with a wonderful woman CEO. Uh, and uh, two years ago, I started my second company. We didn't have a CEO at the time, and so I actually took sabbatical um, to raise the financing and run it myself, um, like Masaya was doing now. And uh, what I noticed when I was sort of out there uh, pitching venture capitalists and starting the company was very acutely that there were very few women founders by my side, very few women in the boardroom, very few women VCs that I was pitching to. So I managed to raise that round and hire a terrific CEO and that company is on its way and I'm on to the next one happily. But when I came back to MIT, uh, what I realized was that really we needed to do the work that Nancy Hopkins and her colleagues had done for women faculty now in biotech. Uh, so I partnered together with Susan Hockfield, who's the president emerita of MIT and Nancy herself, who's now a friend. 
Um, and we, we created something called the Boston Biotech Working Group, which was initially a series of stakeholders around the Boston region. So this would include venture capitalists, deans, founders, um, entrepreneurs. And we started meeting and sort of trying to figure out how we would tackle this problem. We divided ourselves into work streams. And of course, one of the very first actions was let's collect the data. So we got a grant from the Sloan Foundation and a wonderful partner and a woman named Teresa Nelson, who helped us figure out how many women were starting companies just at MIT. Um, and these are the data that I wanted to show you today. And for me, uh, I had the impression, as I said, that women were being left out. And we knew from the, the data in the field that 2.7% of US VC dollars go to women founded companies. I'll say that again, 2.7% of dollars that are women founded companies. Um, but even knowing that, these data actually were really striking. And so if you um, look at the slide, you can see uh, the, the number of companies that were founded in the biology department uh, over time. And so the light blue are the male founded companies uh, by decade, and the dark blue are the female founded companies. And so overall, you can see that 56 companies um, were started in this time and two were started by women. Um, and that's in spite of the fact that women were about 25% of the faculty uh, during that time period. So this was uh, really remarkable. Um, and the other kind of interesting and more potentially optimistic thing, uh, which we found was that there seemed to be sort of microclimates in universities. And so biology is in the School of Science, uh, but in the engineering school where there are in fact fewer women. So here you see data for BE, biological engineering and chemical engineering. There are few women, five out of 21 and five out of 28 on the faculty, but these women actually per capita are starting companies as frequently as their, as their male counterparts. Uh, so of course, overall, there are fewer companies uh, founded by women, but the reasons are different. Um, which was which was really interesting to us and give us some reason for optimism. What is it about the women in those departments, um, which include me, by the way, I'm an engineer, uh, that lead them to start companies per capita at similar rates? And we have a lot of hypotheses about that. Um, the last thing that we observed is shown here, um, and this has to do with uh, the sort of culture of starting a company and how you learn about starting a company and the networks that are involved and the access to capital. Um, and one of the ways you learn is by co-founding a company with a colleague or being on the board of an existing company. And so what we found was of 26 MIT faculty in these three departments who co-founded companies with each other, 26 out of 26 faculty were men. So the men were starting to companies with each other um, and essentially women were never included. Um, and so that again is, is potentially a point of intervention. Um, so I wanted to sort of share these data. This is the beginning of a journey really for us in thinking about interventions. Uh, so the Boston Biotech Working Group has now uh, created a venture capital work stream where the VCs in town are pledging to involve women more on their boards and host them for sabbaticals so that they can learn more about the business. Uh, we at MIT are sounding, founding something called the MIT Future Founder Bootcamp. Um, that I'm co-hosting with Harvey Lodish to try and expose women to stories of entrepreneurship as well as, um, as really lessons about how to go about it. Um, and there's a number of other things that we're trying to do. Uh, one thing that I would love to hear from all of you is how, um, how, if this is a problem where you are and also how one we might amplify our efforts uh, in your institutions. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Christine. Thank you. showed us and a great example of how to help women advance in science and I know you were part of the Nucleus Forum run by the ISSCR um, and uh, made a great impression on the people there so thanks for that and thanks for your presentation we'll come back to the discussion later so uh, Masayo we would uh, love to hear from you you have also a very unusual uh, career in a very uh, unusual social background I would say so please tell us uh, about your life and history okay thank you thank you for kind introduction and i'm masao takahashi from japan 
This photo is the night view of Kobe Eye Center that I am working in now. Okay, I I have been developing retinal cell therapy using neural stem cells and ES cells and now the iPS cells. To to make the cell therapy efficiently, we established this Kobe Eye Center two years ago. And the Kobe Eye Center consists of four parts. One is the uh, Riken uh, research part, and the Eye Center Hospital, and the NPO or for the patient care. And the fourth part is our company called Vision Care Inc. And uh, uh, since last summer, I became a president of this company. Okay, and let me introduce the history of my career. First, uh, I started as an ophthalmologist in the Kyoto University Hospital, and I did the clinical work for nearly more than 20 years in the University Hospital, and I went to the Sok Institute as a postdoc, and that changed my, my life, I think. And after I got back to University Hospital, then I moved to Riken, Kobe, uh, that is a very good basic research center in Japan. Because I pursue the research uh, rather than the clinical work, so I had a, uh, I have the uh, laboratory in Riken. And after 15 years, I became a president. So I have the uh, position in all four parts of the Kobe Eye Center, but my main position is the uh, this company. Okay. And my stem cell research began in 1995 when I became a postdoc under Dr. Rusty Gage at the Soak Institute. That was wonderful experience experience. And there I did two first in the world works. For example, I applied the concept of stem cells to the retinal cell transplantation for the first time. And the other is utilization of lentivirus that was developed in the soak at the time for the animal experiment for the first time. And now that both of them reach to the clinical phase so that I so that I established the company. This is the company profile. So I came through various fields and still playing various roles in the various area. For example, board members of academic uh, uh, societies and doing many committee members in the ministry. And Finally, director of a big company and president of this startup company. Okay. And as you know, Japan is well known to have very low status of women in the developed world. But from my experience in the academia, I never felt such a prejudice. Only once, long time ago, when I was a resident in the Kyoto University Hostel, uh, I was told, you are so talented, but it is a pity that you are a woman from my chief. But only once. But after the, uh, that time, the society in Japan has changed a lot, and I never felt such uh, discrepancy or prejudice. Maybe I was so lucky to have uh, very good bosses in the academia. But in the business field, I was really surprised. In Japan, the status of women are really low in the company and very few executives in the companies in Japan. Six years ago, I made another startup company, but there uh, my words were often ignored and I could not transfer my science nor vision. So I made a company again and became a president. I, uh, uh, with that, I would like to continue our research and I would like to achieve the uh, goal of my vision. Our laboratory is 
totally devoted for the patient and the translational research is going on. So it's suit, suitable for a suit for the company profile, I think. In Japan, there are uh, several women CEO in the cell therapy field. And, um, but still the business in the stem cell field is mainly men's world, I think. And I do not know because of that or not. Sometimes I feel biotech companies are doing money gain and the fee for the treatment is rising and rising. In my opinion, the uh, biotech or medical company should be a kind of social company and exist for the benefit of patients. So our, our company's motto is we will build sustainable medicine like SDGs. In that sense, the pre these presidents are uh, good friends of mine and I think all those companies share such vision. Anyway, it is very good to be a president because I do not have any bosses anymore and I, I can be a rule in the company. So during the course, I now feel the problem of the uh, welfare also. Because welfare is usually a, a target, uh, target the uh, severely impaired people. And the world is built for the uh, for so-called healthy people. But the reality is that the disability has graduate gra gradation and the, uh, from severe impaired people to the light disability. So there's no boundary between the normal and the disability. But the world is built uh, like uh, for the disability world and the uh, healthy people. So never inclusive. And I, I made this NPO or to change the image of visually impaired people and make the real inclusive world, I hope. So in that sense, the diversity is very important and that is good for the world actually. And so oh, about the women problem, I think uh, we don't have to, or we should not focus only women, but uh, seek for the really inclusive world and that is the solution i think okay thank you very much for your attention thank you my Sarah, for a really interesting presentation and a presentation also which showed the many hurdles you've come across uh, i think it's incredible that you just started another company in the face of adversity adversity so we're really impressed so our next speaker will be uh, dr rana dejani from the Hashemite University. Hello, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I, I like to start my talk by saying Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace upon you all. Uh, that's how we greet people from my part of the world, from, from the Middle East. And uh, I'm also, uh, my father is from Palestine, so I'm half Palestinian, and he was a refugee in 1948. Uh, when he was, uh, he and his family were evicted from Jerusalem. And my mother's from Syria, from Aleppo, which is now undergoing a whole refugee crisis in itself. Uh, and, uh, and, and the way I want to share is I always talk about, like I, I do many roles in my life, and I'm sure many of you as well do that. Uh, and because, you know, in English you say you wear, when you play many roles, you say you wear many hats. But I don't wear a hat, I wear a scarf. So I talk about my five scarves to represent my five roles. And usually the first scarf that I wear, uh, which is the one I'm most proud of, is that I'm a parent. Uh, I have four children, and I think that's the most important role I can play in my life uh, because no one else can replace me uh, or as good as, as a parent is. And uh, from an evolutionary perspective, that's the most important role we can play in preparing the next generation uh, to, to make a better world. The second scarf that I wear is I'm an educator. First, I was a teacher for 10 years before I became a scientist. And even now as a scientist, as a faculty member, we're always teaching. So it's a lifelong uh, experience. 
And I think the second most important role we can play is being educators, mentoring and, and teaching and learning as we go through our lives. Because if the children are not spending their time at home, they're spending it in school. And so my hat off to all teachers <laughs> for the great job that they are doing around the world. My third scarf, which is being the scientist, uh, uh, I work on genetics of ethnic populations and on the impact of trauma on epigenetics. Uh, and that led me to uh, establish the first uh, stem, cell, uh, stem cell law regulations in Jordan as an exemplar for other countries in the region. My fourth scarf is that I'm a social entrepreneur. Uh, uh, as uh, Masaya had said, uh, we have a responsibility, not just in our labs, in our lecture halls, but we also have a responsibility for the wider community. So I started a program called We Love Reading to encourage children to read for fun, which actually started in Jordan as a nonprofit and is now in 55 countries around the world. Now, my fifth scarf is something I really didn't aspire to. It, it happened. Uh, I got an email a few years ago that I was chosen as one of the 20 most influential female scientists in the Islamic world, which is 1.6 billion people dispersed all over the world. And uh, when I got that email, it was like, okay, this is great. You know, it's a huge responsibility, but, but, uh, but it's an honor. And I was scrolling down because they had given a title for each one of us. And I was looking to see what title did they give me since I do all these different things. And I found out that the title they had given me was the Islamic feminist. And I said, no, you can't do that. Because when you say Islamic, whether we like it or not, uh, <laughs> half of the world is going to say, hmm, what is she about? And when you say feminist, the other half of the world is going to look at me and say, mm, what is she about? So I kind of lost on both uh, fronts. And I, uh, I emailed them and I said, could you change it? Uh, and of course they refused. And so since then, I've been on a kind of a journey to, to define what that term means and own it on my own terms. So I think in the end, I'm a human being, not, not Islamic, not feminist, just plain human. But the result was writing the book, Five Scarves, Doing the Impossible. If we can reverse sell fate, uh, why can't we redefine success? So I'm going to share uh, bits and pieces of that journey with you, and I hope that I will learn from you if you have any feedback, critique, questions, uh, whether in this session or later on uh, uh, in the future. So the, yeah, and, and the way I approached it was the way I do science, right? What is a scientist? It sees what everybody, a person who sees what everybody sees, but think what no one has thought. And so what I did first is I look at the statistics of, of women in STEM. Because I was trying to understand what does success mean to women scientists and then what does success mean in general. And there was this famous L'Oreal kind of graph that represented, quote unquote, the whole world, which showed that females in high school were almost 50-50 compared to males. But then as they progressed, uh, in um, uh, whether it was in higher education or then later in the workplace, in, in STEM fields, you see that there were less and less women. Now, for me, this kind of didn't make sense in, in the Arab world. So in the Arab world, I could, I drew the red line where we had more up to 70% females, not just in school, high school, but actually in higher education. So we had our PhDs were more than 50%, up to sometimes 67% females. So this kind of challenged uh, this graph from L'Oreal, and, and many times the reason that was put forward in the past was that we had less women in STEM in higher positions is because they wouldn't have enough educated women or talented women. And of course, in the Arab world, this was not, this did not hold. And as Christine had showed in this recent publication in Science, no, we have a plenty of women who reach the postdoc stage and the problem is something else. And, and, and this underlined, when this first came out, to me, this was something to think about. What, what's happening right in some countries where they have more females in higher education compared to others? And maybe it's not always learning from the West, but there could be learning from the East. Uh, and so this, this, actually this article came out talking about implicit attitudes do not usually correlate with a gender gap index um, uh, as, as seen. So the Arab world has a very low gender gap index. However, implicit attitudes uh, show that we have higher women in higher education and STEM. So there's a discrepancy there and a place to learn from. But that led me to then, okay, then why do we have less women in the workplace? And then you look at the, the research and studies looking at the data that it's actually the women who are married, who have children that start dropping off 
uh, uh, in the pipeline. So that, uh, you know, that uncovered a whole other region and talking about we need to accommodate for women who have children or are married and have other responsibilities uh, so that they could stay in, in the workplace. And this is not only in, for sciences, by the way. This applies to women in, in different sectors, whether it's business or law or, or, uh, or, or government. And what, we, what happened is that there were a lot of uh, uh, introduction of measures in the workplace to accommodate women. So maternity leave, uh, places to nurse your baby, uh, you could leave early, things like that. This is great and very, very important. However, it's not done enough in the sense that I was at the UN in Vienna last year and uh, when a female scientist mathematician, uh, there was no place in the whole building for her to nurse her child who was one year old. So obviously we're not doing enough of those measures. And then the, the other thing that came up through Apple and Facebook offering to freeze the eggs of their employees until they're over 40. Uh, ideally treating them not who they are, but as a, a, a as a male, meaning uh, uh, ignoring their bi their biology. And in here, I just want to raise one one or let's say two fundamental differences between males and females that are biological, have evolved through evolution, which is a woman has a uterus and a man doesn't, therefore she's going to carry the baby for nine months, he isn't, and that she nurses that baby, he doesn't. Although some people say, no, in the future, men will be able uh, to have a uterus and hold a baby. And I say, fine, when that happens, we'll discuss it. But evolutionary wise, we are the ones who have this biological difference. And so this leads me to the point is how do we strike a balance? Acknowledging the biological differences, just those two, I'm not talking about anything else, uh, while not discriminating against women. And so uh, to me, uh, th this all goes back not just to making quick fixes, which are band-aids of offering maternity leave or or time or place to. Centric framework. Like 200 years ago, when the Industrial Revolution happened, uh, and and it was men who were going in, so they created their own framework. You know. Power. Uh, there, no. There's two biological reasons, and so what I envision is that if woman. Uh, along with men, could create a new framework uh, of what success means. It would be so diverse, as diverse as the ceiling from a from a mosque in, in Turkey, uh, to reflect the diversity of human beings, right? We're all very different. Our DNA is different. And it's not just men and women. It's differences among different people from different groups. And, and in this case, it's not about equality, as the whole discussion first started decades ago, or even equity or liberation. It's actually about freedom uh, to decide what I want to do. So, uh, I mean, in this slide, it was about, you know, assuming everyone benefits from the, from, uh, from, from what they have. And then equity is equal access achieved, achieved. The liberation is cause of inequality addressed. You know, the supports are no longer needed. What I want to call for is freedom. Who said I want to play baseball to start with? Right. So that's the kind of framework we want to uh, that I call for. And I think we need to um, use. And now today with COVID-19, we have an opportunity. Uh, uh, this is the silver lining. Impossible is possible today. There's no you know, uh, we can't. So it's an opening, a crack to say, let's change the whole system and, and have the freedom to do whatever we want, meaning uh, and, and the only way to do that is through uh, creating laws and policies and regulations where it's gender by design. Uh, but even if you change the rules, that's not enough because you'll have old white men interpreting those rules the way they want. So it's about having diversity at the table, right? Having men and women, and maybe at the beginning to have quotas to ensure you have a 50% representation of women on these boards, in these committees, uh, or, uh, and in, in senior positions. But then also, that's not enough to, uh, to have 50-50% uh, women and men. You also want to be aware of the power dynamics because many times you will have the woman on the table, you tick the box, 
but the women are not being expressive. They're not talking, they're not expressing their opinions and, and so on because of that power dynamic. So this is something we need to train for, facilitate and ensure that people have equal voices. And this is not just, again, about women. It's about minorities, about diversity. And so it's actually changing the whole framework, right? Not, not just bits and pieces here and there. Uh, 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 changing the whole rhetoric. And again, this is including diversity, whether it's sexual diversity, minorities, ethnicities, religions, cultures, as well as gender, because the, di the, the differences between us is not just gender based. And so when we change this rhetoric, we can redefine success. It could be as simple as one person, it could be a, a, a mother or a father, a male or a female, who wants to stay at home with the kids, to somebody who wants to be the CEO, and everything in between. And it's about putting value, a monetary value on all those functions, right? So even if a, if a mother takes time off or a father to be with the child, to have a monetary value on that and not to disregard it as not important, again, valuing that. And, and this makes us look at leadership um, and what we value uh, in a whole different way and have a human perspective, not just the power and dominance and, and money. Um, and, and we can change our mind. If we choose a career path, that doesn't mean we have to stick to that career path throughout our lives, especially we know that for women, there's a biological clock. So rather, this was a, this is a representation of a, a study that was done at MIT a long time ago, showing that, um, men by the age of 40, their, their, their uh, achievements kind of plateau, the red line. And for women, it was a zigzag and kept going up. And to me, like, this is some, uh, a way forward that if I'm a woman and at this time in my life, I choose to become, you know, full blown engineer, I make a company and so on, that's fine. And if I want to take time off because of my biological clock and have a baby, that should be fine too. And both should be valued. Uh, and so re it's about reframing uh, the whole framework of how we look at work and how we look at success. And of course, I want to remind everybody, we're all here talking about success and jobs and engineering and building biotech companies and faculty and science when we know a huge percentage of women and men, for that matter, are actually uh, underprivileged. We are privileged to be in this position. Many are running for their lives uh, in different parts of the world. So let's remember them as we go forward and try to help them as well. Uh, and 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 the, the way forward is to write our stories, to share, because many of the role models and the mentors and the stories out there are coming from one uh, ethnicity and one place part of the world. And if we want to help women all over the world, or for that matter, diversity, we need to have stories from everybody around the world, so that a young woman growing up in uh, in say in Uganda or in uh, Syria has a role model that she can identify with and learn from. So I ask you all to write your stories and not to belittle your stories because everybody is unique and important because your DNA is different. And also mentoring. I mean, it was mentioned earlier. We started a mentoring program in Jordan for the Arab world. We call it Three Circles of Alimat. And the world Alimat means female scientist. And, and this is now a toolbox that you could use for free. Uh, anybody around the world, not just in science, uh, for any field, and not just for women, it could be for Senior with junior, and it's for mid-career, which is a gap in the mentoring uh, field. And lastly, you know, you are butterflies. To me, it's all about the chaos theory. In China, doing little change within yourself, within your local, uh, will uh, make a difference somewhere in the world in time and space. Uh, and so, and the challenges we face today need these kinds of approaches, interdisciplinary innovation, teamwork, putting our hands together and having the courage to challenge the status quo and, and be crazy and, and, and do things that people may not accept. Uh, and, and that's why my book was redefining success. And, you know, when I was in, when I was studying biology, uh, 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 decades ago, if somebody said that we could change an adult cell back into a stem cell, people thought you were either crazy uh, or ignorant. But somebody like Yamanaka challenged that and said, who said, why not? And he was able to, to develop induced pluripotent stem cells. So similarly, why can't we redefine success uh, in a whole new way to make it a difference in the world going forward? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rana. It's uh provoking uh, to hear how you your vision is uh, from the uh, the arab world 
um, and it was really interesting to help us to shape our discussion. Um, we will get, be going to that shortly. Um, I, I, what I particularly like was your zigzag curve uh, for women. And uh, one of the reasons uh, for that is because of those career breaks. But it's important to realize that, that on average, women become full professors a full decade later than men. So on average, uh, women, men are around 40 when they become a professor and women are around 50. So it means the duration of their career after becoming a professor can be quite a lot shorter. Also something we should think about. So um, we're going to go to the questions soon. I just wanted to uh, us to look at a few implications of uh, COVID um, because this is affecting our community and it does intersect with gender roles. So um, the ISSCR actually uh, made it a small survey. Uh, so what we did was um, we asked 762 people from all career stages in 52 countries uh, to do the survey in April 2020 about their COVID-19 uh, experiences. And this was the outcome. So uh, just a few points of this survey. How uh, has your lab been affected by the COVID-19 crisis? So of course, the majority, uh, almost 80% were completely shut down. Um, minimized, but some still ongoing. And so this will be a familiar uh, picture to all of you. But uh, the question of how did you spend your time uh, at home and people could select all that applied. So many were preparing manuscripts, many were analyzing data, designing experiments, writing grants. And the other end of the scale is that there were loads of things uh, to referee uh, that are going on. Um, but others were doing non-research projects and uh, some were doing no projects at all. But so it was a very diverse way people were occupying themselves. But this other, uh, many people noted new childcare responsibilities. And where was that falling? It was, uh, a lot of it was falling on the women. So has your work been disrupted by increasing time spent caring for children and or family members? A large percentage of uh, this other category was spent on increased family care and family care has disrupted work. Now, where we, do, we um, asked also, has COVID-19 uniquely affected women? So how has the pandemic affected women? Um, is the time for video conferencing equally shared among men and women? Is homeschooling equally shared? These are all questions we would love to have insight in. And how will the future publications and job market uh, be affected? So there was a fact recently port reported in Nature or in a survey in Nature, there's a large reduction in women senior authors since the pandemic. So the concern is in a couple of years, this is going to affect gra grant outcomes and successes by women. So we could have a various, very serious knock-on effect down the line um, of these effects, particularly on women. And what are the strategies to overcome or prevent these uh, potential setbacks? And could we think of things like a timeout for maternity leave, um, in, like a maternity leave for a COVID situation where the burden it does seem to be falling largely on women? So could we have some sort of timeout in the way you get compensation for maternity leave in some countries? So these are the, some of the comments that came in in these uh, surveys. I have two small kids and daycare is closed. My husband and I are trying to juggle at home uh, childcare and our jobs. It's extremely challenging. Most of my time is spent with the children as I have four and the youngest one is one and a half. Everyone needs me, whether it's day or night, because I'm home. I have very little time for research. As, a, as I'm a mother of two, I'm splitting my day into small tasks. It's impossible to work two or three hours without interruption. I do one hour tasks, intercalate intercalating my job, being a mom and taking care of the house and starting at 7 a.m. and finishing at 9 p.m. And I must say, we had one talk um, in the session so far where uh, one of our speakers was really stressed with two little kids, didn't feel, feel she had practiced her presentation enough and actually sent apology after um, her talk that she didn't feel well prepared. So collective experience and collective excess. We can ask, what do we do collectively to monitor women in science? Um, how, 
how can these policies be inclusive and encourage diversity? These are really important things we have to think about, uh, not in alone in society in general, but particularly in the ISSER, where we have a sort of community spirit, both from the leadership and the members. And how do women become more visible in their institutes of department? Uh, one of the, that's one of the problems uh, women have is because they sometimes at some periods in their career have less time. So if I mentor people, I say, you always have to ask what the label is on your forehead, because if you don't know what the label is on your forehead, nobody else will. And by becoming a super specialist, we've seen it in our panelists. Masayo is clearly a world expert in the eye. Um, Sangeeta is clearly um, an expert in engineering. And by having these very defined uh, labels on their forehead, you can take uh, some time out uh, and become visible. But how do you do that? We need to mentor uh, younger people on how to do that. And what are the strategies to advance through the hierarchy of academia or business? How are we going to do that? So um, how can more senior women in STEM ha help advance uh, younger women? And among the questions uh, that have popped up is in fact, uh, is there an aggression or is there actually a willingness among women to help younger women? And I think some people have experienced that actually some senior women covered their position as being in the high pecking order and may not be so generous to uh, their junior colleagues. So we're going to have another poll here, um, mostly to poll exactly what you would like to discuss. So we, we defined uh, five possible things we thought on the basis of this, um, this meeting you might like to discuss. And what we'd like you to do is uh, select up to two responses. Please don't uh, fill in more, otherwise we'll get confused. And if you could fill in two of those responses of the things you'd like to discuss. Give you a few minutes to do that now. So two things are clearly emerging, advocating yourself, becoming visible. Maybe that's uh, what I said about what's the label on your forehead and advancing science. Which is about neck and neck with recognizing and coping with unconscious bias. I think most of the vote, votes are in. So managing conflicts with your boss, most people seem to be coping with that. OK, that's really good. Um, navigating interpersonal uh, relationships on the workplace also seems to be going pretty well. Um, advancing science is important, um, almost neck and neck with uh, recognizing uh, and coping with unconscious bias, becoming visible really important and advancing science. OK, it, it is really helpful. Um, we will try and select some of the questions uh, on that basis. So we're going to have a new a few questions now uh, to the panelists. But once we've had as many of those as time allow, we will ask you to join us in the scientific forum in lab one. And please fill out the survey you're receiving at the meeting and email uh, women in science at issr.org if you would like more conversation. Um, so uh, I'd like to start with the first question. Not everybody's put uh, in the name of the person they'd like to address it to, but I start with this one. How do you think the promotion of women in STEM is affected by geographic location? And it might be nice to start with that one because we have a diversity of geographic locations included uh, uh, this afternoon. So um, the, the examples are given a Europe, Europe uh, US, uh, China. But I would also like to add a country like Iran, which has a very robust stem cell field. Um, and uh, if you go to one of their conferences, the, the room is absolutely full of women, who are extremely bright and very active. So uh, perhaps we could start the question with uh, Masayo. Yes. So I guess you would say uh, that um, geograph geography matters, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. What 
What? Oh. Sorry, what's the question? So do you think uh, if you do, had continued your career in the SOC, do you think you would have had the same obstacles? Or do you think going uh, back to Japan made it more difficult? Oh, the the research in the SOC changed my life. And uh, uh, because I found the theme that I pursue for a lo lifelong time. And it was important until then. I thought I was a really ordinary girl. <laughs> and once I found the special theme, I it gave me it, it gave me the uh, strength and I can pursue with the uh, strong power uh, to continue the research. So it is very important to find a, a good theme that you can pursue for a long time. Yeah, exactly. Um, I see Rana would like to say something to that too, and then we'll jump to another question. Yeah, no, thank you. Absolutely, it does differ from geographical locations, and it reflects how women are perceived in that culture. Uh, so for example, for me, uh, I, uh, in Jordan, I don't feel any discrimination as a female, as a scientist, and we get promoted or progress equally men and women uh, the, the challenge is, is doing science in a developing country in general not not per, 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 uh, related to gender itself and your example of iran is similar in jordan we've got tons of these wonderful amazing enthusiastic extremely smart females and they don't feel they don't feel this pressure of gender that i heard in many of my interviews with women scientists in the us where they feel that they have to cover that they're pregnant they can't bring it up to their boss uh, these are scientists uh, at MIT and Harvard and so on. We don't feel that kind of pressure uh, in, in our part of the world. Uh, so that reflects uh, what, what the differences in, in promotion, how, how it is. Again, uh, this is very complex and we need social scientists to really unpack it and really understand. And that's how we could learn. I mean, there may be something going on good in Iran or the Arab world uh, towards, uh, you know, perceiving gender and how design for gender that other parts of the world can learn from. Yeah. Could we jump to uh, Sangeeta because um, you have uh, two children uh, at MIT. I don't know whether you, you were there when you actually had them, but uh, you've been very uh, pioneering in saying, I'm going to work uh, not full time. Could you tell something about that? Sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's very interesting to hear my colleagues talk about telling your own story and choosing um, choosing your own sort of mission. And I think that in some ways, like we were all doing that in parallel, but one of the things that I really wanted to embrace about the profession was that the point of academia is intellectual freedom, right? And we don't have to uh, build our careers uh, in the model of those that are in front of us in the way that the academy has built them. Um, and so what I decided when we had uh, our two girls was that I wanted to be home with them one day a week. I chose Wednesday, we called it mommy day. I wanted to take them to school. I wanted to know their friends. I wanted to drive them around in carpool. And I think in the beginning, I was actually quite shy about that. I didn't talk about it openly. It was a private decision that I made with my husband. And my assistant would actually tell people that she's off campus on Wednesday, but we would never say why. And then over the course of my career, I felt like it was really important actually to share that with people and broadcast it as a choice, as a way that we can change our profession. Um, because we don't have to spend 200 days on a plane. We don't have to work all the time. We can all, you know, this is our profession to live and uh, tell our own stories. Yeah, I think many, many women will recognize that. I mean, you're a generation uh, behind me, but I used to hide the fact that I had to go one day a week to have lunch with my kids from school, which I loved because I had 10 of their friends at the same time. But I used to sneak off and pretend it was a meeting, I must yeah. say. Yeah. Um, so there's another question here. Uh, it goes back to one of our surveys uh, and it's more of a comment. It would be interesting to ask questions of leadership and on, on, of knowledge institutions and to young scientists uh, of the same institutions, um, how they regard uh, the efforts to, um, to um, yeah, publicize what they're doing about gender balance. Um, it would be really nice to know why those are not emerging. 
Um, so there's a comment here also about uh, the uh, future founder bootcamp you mentioned, uh, Sangeeta. And the question is really, could you imagine doing it virtually? I'm sure a lot of people would like uh, to join. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. And it's one of these sort of COVID silver linings. Actually, we were initially planning to launch it in the spring. And the vision had been to create sort of a small cohort um, of women that were interested in starting companies and sort of uh, help nurture them and build relationships. Um, and then, of course, the pandemic hit and we were all at home. And actually, what we realized was then, oh, well, we can open it up to the world. We can invite women founders from across the country, across the world to speak, and we can also record them and archive them. And so MIT actually has agreed to um, all of that and we'll have um, all of the lectures broadcast on, you know, to everyone and then archival. So hopefully they can be available to everybody. Fantastic, that would be really good. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people interested uh, to join. So uh, last year we had very few men in the, for the lunch as it was. And we've got a lot more men online uh, now. And there's a question to the men. Uh, for the men who, who uh, want to be good allies, what advice can you give them that would be uh, most helpful? So many of us women have uh, had role models in other women. My particular one was Anne McLaren, who I, the late Anne McLaren, who I admired enormously. Um, Nancy Hopkins was mentioned, but there are men who would like to help us. So what advice could we give them? So uh, Masayo, what would you say, what would, advice would you give the men around you? To the men? <laughs> don't say <laughs> the pity. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's a joke, but uh, uh, yes, please see, don't see us as a pity people. I always think about the disability people and the worlds are making them pity because they recognize they're very weak people or something like that. The same thing is for the women, I think. So please see equally. <laughs> that's, that's only one, I think. Do you have anything to add to Sangeeta? I mean, you're in a very I... men environment at MIT. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a couple of concrete suggestions. So first of all, there's a documentary that was um, released last week called Picture a Scientist that uh, tells the story of the MIT 16, which I described, but also the new National Academy, US National Academy report on sexual harassment. Um, and some leaders, some male leaders, for example, at Cold Spring Harbor are gonna be showing it to every incoming uh, employee. And just to, to really understand, understand and learn about the problem and, and what you can do about it. So that I recommend to everybody. It's called Picture a Scientist. Um, you can Google it. Um, the other thing I would offer is um, for the men to really become, uh, I think, similar to the race conversation right now, moving from a passive participant and recognizing your own bias to really being an activist. And that can mean different things to different people. But a simple thing to do is to pick a list of strong women um, alternate speakers. If you can't give a talk, when I can't give a talk, I always suggest three other women. Um, if you are you know, starting a company, put a woman on your board, put a woman on your scientific advisory board, you know, bring women along, be an active participant um, and always be asking yourself like, if there's a strong woman in your institute, you know, not just be her mentor, but be her sponsor um, and, you know, show her what she doesn't know she can achieve. I, I feel like there have been men in my life all along the way who have actually pushed me beyond my own conception of my own boundaries. Um, and that can make a huge difference. Yeah, I think I think you make a, a really, really good point there. Um, w women need to to have the confidence to join, but they some, it sometimes needs to be pointed out to them. And um, that's exactly what uh, that, that science uh, article made the point that women have so much reflection that if they think they're not going to make it in science, which may be completely un incorrect, they uh, may look for other skills like writing or, or something like that um, which, as an alternative. And sometimes at that critical moment, some good mentoring being put on a, a board where you have responsibility or in a leadership position can make such a difference. And it's about recognizing those 
crucial moments where somebody's kind of wobbling, which way am I going to go? Just getting them right in time. And it can even be something as trivial as, as uh, it, it sounds very trivial when I say, changing your name when you get married. Um, I remember one of my uh, PhD students, she got married and she immediately wanted to change her name. Um, and she would lose her visibility uh, of all the publications she had before. And if she got divorced, then she'd lose them again. So you see, sometimes you, the way monitoring of science works, if you can't stick to one name your whole life, it gets problematic. So um, those are tr trivial things, but sometimes you need pointing out to people. Um, so looking for more questions. So the question, it's a question for all. Since most of the barriers are intangible, what would be the best way, uh, best way to measure true equality other than numbers uh, with male and female in certain positions? So we're kind of doing something, you know, like uh, impact factor here. We're just putting people in category male or female, which is a very kind of broad category. Could we uh, get more diversity in that? Um, could we uh, minority groups? It, it would be useful, but we're not always allowed to ask that information. Uh, how could we bring this uh, so we know where to help the right people at the right time? Anybody take us on that question? Um, I, I can jump in. I mean, to me, it's about engaging people, putting them involving them, uh, Sangeeta mentioned that. So any committee, any meeting, any responsibility to, to make sure that the percentages uh, reflect those of the uh, collective community around us. And that's how you put them there and you make sure that their voice is heard because they're part of that committee and they have to uh, share part of that responsibility, which, which leads to uh, people having to work together and, and trust each other going forward. So I think uh, there was one question about quota, maybe in the beginning, yes, to make sure everybody's at that table uh, and, and heard. That is a, is a point, but I don't know how many of you, but um, sometimes you're on overloads with committee because they need a woman on the committee or on the fence of a PhD or something like that. So many women are still find themselves alone on these committees, but they need one woman. Um, and it's very difficult to say no, um, but you can't do everything. So I, I don't know how people in the field deal with that. Of course, the representation is, is important, but it's about educating institutes and also uh, having a group of men who are, let's say, on our side and not just on, on our side, but on the side of minorities in general. I mean, perhaps women is just one issue, but uh, people of color is, is a major issue. Um, and, and you see every time there's a, a move to the right in the politics, that's all these issues pop up again. So we will continue to have these problems unless at the institute director levels, these issues are addressed. So what do we think about having a quota? Sangeeta, well, uh, what would you think if half the faculty at MIT had to be female? So we do have um, uh, an institute, a university in the Netherlands, where they had a, a block on employing male faculty for six months. They were only allowed to uh, employ female faculty. Now, this was regarded as discrimination, but nevertheless, it worked. They had an awful lot of associate and uh, senior professors uh, employed in that period. What would happen if you did that at MIT? I guess there would be a revolution. There would be a revolution. I will say my, 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 um maybe controversial view, uh, having really watched how slow these change, societal changes can be, is that you can, you know, change the data first and the hearts and minds will follow. Um, I really believe that. So I, I personally believe in quotas of all kinds. <laughs> I think it does not mean that you are sacrificing quality. I think that is a common misperception. I think diversity is excellence. It is not a trade-off. And if you give people quantitative benchmarks, they, you know, they can have their own internal biases. And, you know, we'll deal with that later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. So you made a good point there. These, uh, yeah. these education programs uh, for unconscious bias, um, I guess many of them have seen these movies. I, I personally find a lot of them very trivial. They, they are badly acted and, and not always very convincing. 
So we actually need uh, perhaps the arts to make some really convincing bias uh, movies like now. They could do it uh, offline and, and, and send them to us. Uh, at least they'd have something uh, very constructive to do in this field. Uh, maybe I can comment on that. Uh, some of the training about unconscious bias, not just for gender, but for minorities and ethnicities and so on, to, to have a directed training, especially for facilitators, how to facilitate to make sure that those have a voice. So it's not just training for the individuals, but training for the facilitators, whoever's in charge as well. Yeah. So there's a, another question here. Um, there have been stories regarding men having qualities that future potential is attributed to versus women who are only perceived as having qualities or skills that they've already obtained. So they, they're not developing future potential. So how much uh, do you think if that's true? Firstly, is that true? Um, and secondly, what could we do about it to to train women to be prepared for a different kind of future. In this survey in, in science, again, which I thought was very interesting, women's perception uh, that they could do math is rather low. And uh, without um, sort of uh, going back to the Larry Summers uh, contra controversy in, in Harvard many years ago, the perception of women is, is sometimes quite early on, they can't do math or something like that. Um, but maybe uh, the perception of themselves in other things is also not high. So how do we, we make them uh, realize they do have more potential? Maybe I could, I could start. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, one thing, it's not, I think it's not the underrepresented person's role to change the system per se, but I will say that we have a role in our journey and my thinking has always been, you know, as I said, I was a daughter of immigrants and we, I was taught that education is the way up. And so I am a sort of student of life and everything that I've ever wanted, I have studied. Um, and I mean that in, in, even in leadership. So if I was a sole woman on a committee, I would study that committee. I'd say, look at that person. He is able to sway the room. How did that happen? You know, and then you study it like, oh, look, he had a backdoor conversation with so and so and so and so. He populated the committee with so and so and so and so. He picked the moment to make his case, you know, and he was able to persuade a, a number of people. How did this person get the startup package they got? How did this person get plussed up on their NIH grant? You know, and so for me, like that sort of like studying how people um, are able to acquire what we consider to be, um, subjective advantages, uh, I became a student of that. Um, and, and so I, you know, I never asked for an NIH grant that was smaller than my colleague, um, you know, because I just, I didn't want to be that person. <laughs> like, well, I'm going to get what he got. <laughs> how, did you, how did you get that degree of confidence? Where did it come from? Because your background wouldn't be committed to that. I think it comes back to what Rana was saying, which is it really, it's how you're raised. I, I, uh, that's how I was raised by my parents. Like you were born to be the best. That was, you know, for better, for worse. That's what they told me every day of my life. They, you had great parents. So maybe uh, the ones people online will uh, try to remember that. You've got to believe in your kids. Right? <laughs> and, and maybe trust. I want to add trust. You know, trust yourself. Trust, trust the females around you. Sometimes we don't trust them enough. You know, push them out, let them explore and be behind them, pushing them out. I think a big, and for the men, trust women, trust that they know what is right, when to do things and how to do things. I think society doesn't trust women enough. Um, yes, I think that's a good point. So uh, there's a question here. We discussed quite in, in, the, in the beginning about high achievers and, and somebody made the comment, which I think is perhaps real, um, ha they have the feeling that among top achievers in, in both genders, women top achievers have to work so much harder uh, than their men. Is that true, do you think? <laughs> I think I the think men probably go to boiling it, point here. <laughs> I think uh, the, if the, uh, the women's a minority, the number of the uh, people in the high achievement uh, very low, then the hard work uh, only 
um, only the hard worker can go up, but the number is increased. And then the variety of women, mm -hmm. hard workers and the not hard workers, variety of people were uh, emerging. So numbers is still important, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, important. Well, I think um, sometimes men uh, network differently than than women. Is that your impression as well? Mm. But again, gradually the women um, leaders are increasing. So uh, we should wait a little bit more time to to uh, have more people in the top level and people can see the uh, variety of types of leaders, women leaders are there. Then the young people can learn. We, we uh, I should not, uh, I, uh, I do not have to be a hard worker and yeah. doing, uh, find a way to do the, to become a leader. So, so thank you. Um, so we showed a lot of statistics in the beginning. Sangeeta showed some statistics, which is uh, gives us insight into the kind of problem we have, but it hasn't really offered any solutions. So could I ask each of the panelists to think of either one or two solutions to this problem? What would you say we should do next? Uh, let's put it in the context of ISOCR. So uh, one, what should uh, ISSCR leadership do to help this issue? Um, we, we certainly do our best on the program committees. We always know we have to ask more women uh, to give talks than men to get a 50-50 balance. We don't know why, but it, we can only suppose. But what is the solution both in our institutes and, uh, and at ISSCR? So can I begin with Sangeeta? Sure. I think, um, I think, Christine, you showed the leaky pipeline and some, I think all of us showed some version of it. And what I would say is there are two sets of interventions. The first are institutional. So as a society, I think it's perfectly reasonable to set quantitative targets and really importantly to enforce them. Um, one thing that we know about diversity work is it's not enough to have the conversation, although it's a great place to start but you, you need to make guidelines and you need to hold people to them and you need to track that data and you need to monitor that data institutionally. Um, the second thing I would say is that we can all make personal interventions anywhere along the pipeline. And everyone I talk to, I always say, you can be a diversity advocate. You don't have to solve the whole problem. You just pick the problem that's closest to you and near and dear to your heart. Is it, you know, is it high school outreach? Is it postdoc placement? Is it, mentoring a faculty colleague, whatever level it is, you just choose yours and we all, you know, all help is welcome. <laughs> yeah. I would uh, agree. And, and um, what, you know, if you, if this were a live meeting and we were walking around uh, with among 4,000, 4,500 delegates, how many uh, black Americans or Africans would we see? Not very many. And that's, it's not our field. If we're going to law or economics, we may see a lot more. But it's very strange that somehow our field doesn't attract or is not attractive to people looking for those futures. Um, another question, or unless anybody, does anybody else have a, a possible solution? I, I want to jump and add, yeah, I want to add to what Sangeeta says. When those policies and regulations are, are created at the institutional level, they sh it should be women who are creating those. Many times it's just men who think they know uh, and they just get a check from somebody, from a female, say, yeah, that's fine. No, the women should be the ones who are creating those laws and regulations. And because they know better, there's things that the men don't even know. They're unconscious of it. And, and on the individual level, to call out any power dynamics that you feel is not right, to call it out as an individual. And if everybody calls out everything, people will become aware, whether they're doing it intentionally or unintentionally they start becoming aware of what they do. So if you see something, say something. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a good point because one of the questions was when you've seen discrimination within the workplace, how do you address it? Firstly, have you done anything about it? And have you actually um, actually 
you know, reported it or mentioned it or addressed it in any way. Masayo, have you seen, uh, you've seen prejudice uh, against women? Do, I'm, luck, I'm lucky enough I, around us uh, in Japan. Nowadays, many institutes in every company wants to raise the women in a top uh, high level position. For example, we can always uh, recruit the women PI, but no application, a few, very few applications. So I think the, uh, as, as Ren said, that the confidence of the women is most important. And that is from the education and the self-esteem and the, I think, again, the same as the disability, but the uh, self um, prejudice inside them is the most hard hurdle for them. So the, from the mm -hmm. childhood, we should educate to remove the hurdle, I think, in the women. I agree entirely. I think sometimes the glass ceiling is self-imposed. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. Uh, lifted. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a more general question: What would be the most important advice uh, from you to junior women in science, say at PhD student level? What would you What would you advise them? Sangeeta, we begin with you. Sure. I think um, I loved what Rana had to say about redefining success, um, and I would say. You should choose our profession and and participate in the change of it because we have such an opportunity to impact patients collectively, uh, even if you know it feels yucky and competitive and you don't see any women that you know you want to be like you should still come and change it and choose it because we that's the only way forward. Yeah. Rana. Well, I mean, uh, building on what Sangeeta said, you know, first, personally, believe in yourself, you know, believe in your gut feeling. It's always going to be right, regardless of the mm. people around you. That's very, very important. Uh, and seek out other people and ask their advice. Don't be intimidated. Even if somebody seems to be big and huge, send an email, you know, uh, share your story and say, I want your advice. Maybe... 10 out of nine out of 10 will refuse, but you'll find that person, one person who's ready to offer. And sometimes you, all you need is a simple word or a simple response that will help push you forward. And, and I just want to add here, I think one responsibility we can do as in societies and, and networks is to showcase stories of people who look like them. So you talked about uh, African Americans not being uh, 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 in the science field. I'm sure there are a few. Showcase those stories, make them big. You know, Muhammad Ali used to say, he kept saying when he was fighting, I am beautiful, because he wanted to change the impression of young children growing up of who they are. And, and that has to be repeated in the sciences for the different minorities uh, to showcase their stories really big. So a child grows up and thinks, oh, you know, there's plenty of black people. And, and that's how you change the rhetoric. Yeah, yeah. And, and that actually gets back to what Deepak said in the opening uh, speech was we don't have to just sit there passively and be tolerant. <clears throat> we actually have to go out there and look for people, say, look, we'd like you. And we need to give uh, showcases the opportunity to put on their show. And and this is what we are, uh, we've are we been discussing. And, and I think it's really important to moving forward. So, uh, Masaya, what would your advice be to somebody junior? Not only for the women, but the, also for the men, as I said, I found uh, uh, my flag at the age of 35, so at the Salk Institute. So please find some flag and uh, uh, be to be become be a little bit strategic. Mm -hmm. After finding some flag, then the people notice and the grant will come and everything is okay. I think so. Find the interesting thing to pursue long life lifelong okay so, so i think that was um a good point uh, to finish off now it was a good que good question what to do for the juniors my own would be still find the label on your forehead because that way you'll become your own showcase and you will be able to say who you are and i, I think that's uh, whether you're male or female of course it's important but females have a tendency to want to be helpful to everybody and not get their own label 
So um, I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists for spending their time with us. It was fantastic. Uh, I think you gave wonderful talks of, from your own experience, a diversity of backgrounds and challenges, um, quite different from, from what we've seen before, um, from entrepreneurship to uh, basic academic science, which is brilliant. So thank you very much for your time. We will be now moving uh, to a forum. So we couldn't, of course, cover uh, every, all of the questions that were asked. Some of you may want to go and discuss further. If this had been a real meeting, we'd have uh, broken down into breakup sessions and like we did last time and had a report back. Um, we think we'll certainly think about uh, pursuing this, this idea of uh, getting some statistics together for our field. And so please join us in the scientific forum. Uh, also, please fill out the survey you will receive after this meeting. And uh, thank you all for your time and enjoy the rest of ICCR. Goodbye. <laughs>